All right. Well, here we go. Today we're going to talk about some of the mathematical ideas that you're going to see in this class. And as you know, you have the notes in front of you. We're going to work through some of these problems. One of the reasons that we have to go over this every year, especially in chemistry, is because you are going to see so many of these mathematical concepts on such a regular basis that it's good to review them and practice them so that when you see these concepts, they don't hinder you in your growth as a chemist. All right, some of the things that we'll be looking at today are SI units. Okay, SI units um, actually don't stand for like, you know, it's not actually an English word. Okay, so SI actually is a French term. So if, do any of you have French? Any of you take French? Okay, ask your teacher what it means. Okay, it's something uh, French. And if I knew French, I would tell you. Okay? No. No, Sean, no. Okay? So, then you have... Oh, man. Turned off on me here. Not the microphone. Okay, so now we have, and then units. Okay, what are some SI units? Anyone want to give me some examples here? Yeah, the meter would be a great example of an SI unit. What else? The cent... Which one? The centimeter is not an SI unit, so to speak. What else would, what would be one? Kilogram. kilogram is one, okay? That is actually for mass. So we have kilogram, meter. What other ones? The liter is the SI unit for volume. What else? Mole. Oh, I love the mole. I love moles. They're great. And I'm not talking about the furry blind creatures that destroy your yard, because I don't really know if there's too many humans that truly love moles. But what I am talking about is this number that is astronomical. And we're going to talk more about it. If you know anything about the mole, you know it was invented by a guy by the name of Avogadro. And if you've never had his guacamole from Trader Joe's, check it out. Okay? If you'd like to know what the package looks like, it's pinned to my board over there by Newton. All right? Avogadro's guacamole. It's delicious. Okay? And really has nothing to do with the mole, but it's great guac. All right? So check it out. It's delicious. All right. Moving on. SI units. SI units, there are seven base units. Some of them we don't use. For instance, we don't use candelas. Does anyone know what candelas are for? Okay. Candela sounds a lot like what word? Candle. And candles usually give off, yeah, it's our measurement of light. We don't really use candelas in chemistry so much. Okay, we might say something is giving off light or not giving off light. That's about the extent of it. In physics, however, we would measure light. Okay, so you know, different classes, different uh, different units, or at least the ones we use on a regular basis. Time. Time is important. Okay, because we measure it in what? Seconds. How do you define time? What is it that we use to define time? Well, clocks, but how do clocks know what a second is? What do you think? The sun? Sure, but see, what happens if, like, there's an eclipse or the sun is down? How do we know what a second is? No. Because the moon doesn't always, it's not always there. You can't always see the moon. Sometimes it's, like, dark. Like a new moon. What else? How would we define a second? What about clapping? Could you, did you, could you define a second as a clap? Okay, so, okay, you clap. Okay, great, now you clap. Okay, now I'm going to clap. Is that a second? Well, what about the slow clap? The, the slow clap is awesome. It's not a second? So could we use, well, I think it's a clap. Do you, but you say it's not a, like a full-blown clap. Okay, the problem is that we're all different. I could go like this. And I could go like this, and that would be different, even by like a fraction of a second. So we can't use claps, okay? We could, you know, go 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, but some people talk really fast, like 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. That wouldn't work, okay? We could base it on a loud noise. Bam! Okay, but then that, that doesn't really work either because everyone's loud noises are different, okay? Lily's way different in loudness than I am, all right? Probably louder. So... We can't use human anything. We have to use physical phenomena. And the fact that you said the sun actually was great. It used to be that we would divide the length of a day up by 86,400, and that was a second. That was fine. 
until we realize, oh, the length of every day is not the same. As a matter of fact, one year is not exactly 365 days. Okay? What do we have to do every four years? Leap year. And actually, then we have to accommodate for that every, like, thousand years. Okay? So a length of a day is actually not exact. It's not changing. It's not actually 24 hours. It's a little off. Okay? So we can't use the length of a day. So scientists said, oh, you know what? Let's... Let's do this thing where we find something that's really consistent and let's divide it up or measure it out so that it equals exactly a second. And they did this. They found this cesium isotope. We talked about isotopes a little bit already. You should know a little bit about them. They found this cesium isotope and they said, bam, 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 it gives off radiation. Okay? And it gives off radiation and every 9 billion times it gives off radiation, well, that's one second. So, boom. A second was born, and that's what we use to this day. Your watches, your phones, your clocks, anything that measures time is based on this measurement of cesium. Okay? Does anyone know how they measure a kilogram? Nope. Nope, because scales, are, scales have to be calibrated. They have to know how to measure a kilogram. So, and we're actually balances, not scales. Scales measure weight. It's different. What would be... A kilogram. How would we know what it is? Okay, but then what's a gram? One thousandth of a kilogram. Oh, and the circular, arg circular argument ensues. It is a hunk of metal sitting in France. That's it. It's a hunk of metal sitting on a pedestal in France. That's a kilogram. And every kilogram in the whole entire world, universe for that matter, is based on this hunk of metal in France. Now, could you imagine stealing that hunk and changing it? Oh, chaos okay so there's that now what about a meter a meter is defined as the time it takes for light to travel like one like trillionth of a second okay that's a meter so we define all of these units, SI units that we were talking about based on physical phenomenon based on things that are occurring around us okay that's how we define them so they're important to us, and we'll use them over and over and over and over and over and over again. Now, sometimes we have units like the centimeter. Oh, that's messy. Let's keep going here. The centimeter, and it's a lovely unit. It's got this big C. It's got this nice little lowercase m. It's just wonderful in so many regards, the centimeter. However, what is really the unit here? It's not actually the whole centimeter. What is it? The meter, this is actually the unit, right here, the meter, okay? If I could point to it, it'd be this guy right here, okay? The C is actually what we call a prefix. It goes out front, right here, this is the prefix. If I could actually, and X, there we go. Prefixes go in front of units. They're actually a way of rewriting numbers so that we don't have to write them in scientific notation. Okay, centi means what? It means a hundred, but it actually means one one hundredth. Okay, it actually means you divide something into a hundred and you take one slice of it. So where do we usually see centi attached to? Meters, yeah, centimeters. Centimeters means that we take a meter stick, we divide it into a hundred and take a little portion. That's a centimeter, one one hundredth of a meter. It actually literally represents... Equal signs don't work very well in here, so. One one hundredth of a meter. It literally represents that number. Now, every time we wanted to write one one hundredth of a meter, or two one hundredths of a meter, or three one hundredths of a meter, whatever, we would have to write them out. And that would be cumbersome and boring. And people don't like fractions. So, of course, then they would just not use these numbers. And we would never measure anything. We'd be a barren society of wasted minds. And so, anyway, we add the C, the centi, and boom! Now it's something that we love to use. Okay? Something that we use all the time. There's also something that's even smaller than the centimeter that we use on meter six. And it's called the millimeter. It's my favorite. It's so small yet and so underrepresented. But it's a very important measurement. The millimeter. I love the millimeter. Okay? The millimeter. <sighs> Glorious. The millimeter is also only a prefix attached to a unit. Same unit, meters. But now milli means what? What? 
Excellent. Nice job, Christopher. You made it in the film, video, both. Okay, one one thousandth. So we take a meter, we divide it into a thousand, take one of them, and bam, the millimeter is born, and it's awesome. Okay, the millimeter, and we can do this with all our units. We can do it with liters, we can do it with grams, we can do it with candelas, we can do it with moles, though we don't really do it with moles so much. Okay, so we see that these prefixes, these units are important. If you look in your notes, okay, turn the page. I think this is page what? Six? Yeah, six at the top. You have some common prefixes. We have the kilo, which means a thousand, like kilometer. Okay? Kilogram means a thousand. Then we have the deci. Okay? And you might get like decimeter or deciliter or decigram. And that means usually, I believe, one tenth. Correct? Yep. And then you have centi, one one hundredth, milli, one one thousandth, and micro. Okay, now, I do love the millimeter, or the milli, you know, it's great. However, there's micro, and then there's like, what was it, mega and micro? I can't remember exactly. Micro, let me see if I get it right here, is 10 to the negative 6? Yes. yes, it means one millionth. Okay, micrometers. We see this relationship a lot. Believe it or not, how many of you are familiar with the term pixel? Okay, where do we see this term used all the time? In cameras, yeah. And when we are talking about cameras, how do you know a camera is good? Okay, if it has lots of pixels, usually we refer to the pixel on, let's say, an iPhone as having how many megapixels, right? And the standard iPhone has how many megapixels? Does anyone know? iPhone 5 has 8 megapixels, okay? The Samsung S4 has, does anyone know? 13 megapixels, okay? However, and that means like, that means like 13 million pixels. Now, many of you know that, oh, 13 megapixels is way better than 8 megapixels. And yeah, sort of. But actually, not every pixel is the same size, okay? Bigger pixels actually give you a better quality picture. And usually what happens is when they take lots of pixels, like 13, and they'll say that it has more pixels, but then they'll shrink the size of the pixel. So you're actually not getting as good a quality of picture, even though there are more pixels in the picture. Uh, an example of this would be iPhone 5S, released last night. It's an 8 megapixel camera, didn't change the megapixels, but they did increase the size of a pixel from 1.1 micro okay, meters to 1.5 micrometers. Now you might think, oh, whoa, right? That means the pixel's a little larger, means that you get a better quality picture. As a matter of fact, it will be the best camera on the market, not that I'm biased or anything. So, these prefixes, megapixel, micrometer, okay? These terms still come into play, even in our day-to-day -day lives. You have phones that have cameras that are based on these ideas. Some people will buy a whole new phone because it has a better camera, more megapixels, or a larger micrometer per pixel. So, these kinds of things are important to us, all right? And we all, and it all comes back to this idea of prefixes, SI units. What do these mean? Pixel is, by the way, a standard unit. Um, I'm not sure if it's made it into the official metric units yet, but it is pretty popular now, you know, uh, because of all the high def and everything that's going on there. All right, so we have SI units prefixes. You are responsible for knowing both tables on page five and six. The one at the bottom of page five, the one at the top of page six. You need to know those terms. Okay, milli, micro, you need to know their letter. Now, the big one there, the one that looks kind of like uh, let's see here. Oh, it's backwards. This is called mu. I love it. Mu. Yep. You can say it after me. Mu. Oh my gosh, you guys are so lame. Mu. mu. Yeah, exactly. It's supposed to sound funny, okay? Mu. It means, obviously, micro. It's a Greek letter, actually. And we use lots of Greek letters in our uh, physics and our chemistry and science. Actually, if you were to take science all the way through college, and it's not really all that hard, so if you wanted to, it's not such a bad career path. 
if you were, not only would you make big bucks when you're done, but you would probably use every Greek letter, capital and lowercase, by the time you were done. I think I used every Greek letter twice in some way, shape, or form in some physics class somewhere. Okay? And, of course, if you go to a college somewhere and there's like a fraternity or sorority, you see the Greek letters on there too. Greek letters are everywhere. They're all around us, and we use them all the time. Why do you think we use Greek letters versus, let's say, A, B, C, D, E, F? Why? Yeah, we don't really speak ancient Greek. So we still have the alphabet, so we use it, but we don't speak ancient Greek, so it's not going to conflict with our normal speech, our normal writings. Okay, so we use Greek letters for that very reason. The same reason we use Roman numerals. Roman numerals come from a language that's no longer really active or a, even a society as a whole that has adopted another language and other writings and things like that. So we don't even, they use Italian. They write in Italian over in, in Italy. So Roman numerals have also become a thing that has been adopted into scientific communities and essentially super, the Super Bowl. So, um, all right, moving on. You have your prefixes. Today, our main focus is scientific notation. How many of you are familiar or have at least had to look at this at once in your life? Okay, once in your life. Good. So somewhere along the lines, you at least had a great experience, right? You were exposed to scientific notation. It's a highlight of your youth. All right, today we're going to expand upon that. We're going to give you an opportunity to really explore your inner scientific notation. Okay, and we're going to do so by looking at what it even means to have something in scientific notation. All right, so scientific notation is really not hard at all. Scientific notation is basically a number. Okay, and in, yes, this represents a number, followed by a decimal point. Okay, now, I didn't put two numbers out front. I didn't put three numbers out front. I didn't put a zero out front. I put a number, a counting number, a number that is either one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. This number out front has to be one to nine. We call those our counting numbers. Okay, if you were into any kind of numberology or you talked about it in mathematics, the difference between you know, whole numbers and integers and counting numbers and all that jazz. This has to be a counting number. So when you count, you start at one okay, and go up from there. It cannot, cannot be zero. Then in scientific notation, you add some more numbers. Okay, we add a number here. Oh, bless you. And you could add a number here. And we could keep going and going and going and going. It depends. We'll talk about why. Okay. But the decimal always is one right of that first number. Then you add something. And this might seem like a lot of work up at first. You add a times. Anyone know? Oh, 10. Wonderful. What a great number. OK? You add a 10. Is it ever 11? No. 12? No. 13? No. Oh, man. That's right. It's never any of those because it's 10 the power of the metric system, because it's by multiples of 10. 10, and then you add some number up here, exponent. You will never have just 10. It will always have an exponent. Let's say that you wanted that 10 to represent a 1. Okay? How, what kind of exponent would be up there? Anything raised to what power gives you 1? 0. If you want this to be times 1 or whatever, it would be 10 to the 0 power. If you want it to be times 10, 10 to the first power. You want it to be times 100, 10 to the second power. If you want it to be times 1,000, 10 to the third. See, the beauty of the metric system, and here in America we're so odd, okay, because we're one of only three countries in the whole world that doesn't use the metric system. But we are our own person. We like to be unique. We have our own form of expression. Hence, we're American. And then as Americans, we like to do things the hard way. So we don't use the metric system. But in the metric system, it's so easy. You just multiply by 10 or divide by 10. That's it. That's how you change your numbers. Okay? Multiply, divide by 10. You know, in America, a mile is 5,280 feet. Nice round number to remember. And then you have, there's 12 inches and one foot because that makes a lot of sense. And then there are three feet and one yard because that seems consistent. Okay? Who came up with this system? I don't know. I personally would have words. But needless to say, the metric system is what we use in science because every country besides three use it. Okay? So when you think of all the scientists from all the nationalities in all the countries in the whole world, and 
in the International Space Station, because they're not on the world, all right, they use the metric system. That's so, if someone decides to go to Germany and do an experiment, every, and they use the metric system, most everyone will be able to understand and interpret their results. See, it's for the sake of collaboration, which is the key in science, right? Collaboration. We, as a society, take information, we put it together, and we collaborate. We work together. That's science. Science isn't something we do by ourselves. It's something we do as a community. Okay, and That's why in a lab you have research assistants and scientists and multiple people working to discover something. It used to be one guy would come up with something, like Newton, the dude up there with the crazy hair. Okay, Or Avogadro and his guacamole. Okay, But now, today, it's not one person. It's a community, like us, in here. We're a community. We're a class. And together, collectively, we will come up with ideas and we will explore concepts. Chemistry, in essence. Okay, so scientific notation, one number, decimal. You can have multiple numbers here, okay, three, four. You usually don't use more than three or four, okay? Times 10 raised to a exponent. And we write numbers in scientific notation Why? Does anyone know? Because say what? So they're not extremely long. So they're not extremely long. 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 Yes. The numbers we work with in chemistry are astronomically huge. So much so that some of the numbers we work with, if we were to count them out, would not, we would not be able to count to them in our lifetime, our children's lifetime, our grandchildren's lifetime, our great-grandchildren's lifetime. We couldn't count to the numbers we work with. It's not possible to count to them. Okay, for instance, a mole. Does anyone know what a mole is? Anyone? Six? Does anyone know? Zero, two, times 10 to the 23rd. We're going to talk more about this number. This number is very famous. Okay, the mole. It's actually a quantity that we work with. And it's like a dozen or a baker's dozen or something like that. It's just a quantity we use in science. Okay, it was discovered by Avogadro when he was working with gases. And there's more to it than that, but that's the basic gist. You are going to use this number so many times that when I say the mole, you're going to groan in your sleep. You'll be thinking about the moles. You'll be dreaming about moles, not the furry little creatures that can't see, but the number. This number right here. This number, if I had this many marbles, Okay, and I haven't lost my marbles, but if I had this many marbles, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, it would cover the surface of the earth 50 miles thick. Okay, the tallest building in the world is not barely a half mile tall. 50 miles off the surface of the earth, just marbles, would be one mole of marbles, this number right here. Okay, if I had a mole of dollars, okay, American dollars, I had a mole of them. If I spent a billion dollars a day for a trillion years, I couldn't spend all of it. Okay? Now, that would be nice, wouldn't it? New pair of shoes, car, house. You could pretty much buy the whole earth at that rate. And you still couldn't spend all the money that this number represents. If you had a mole of particles of sand, okay? Now, think about sand. Think about how gritty it gets in your shoes. Think about, you know, you got your little inflatable toys and your, your ducky ring, okay? And you're going to the pool. All right, and you get that sand. Well, I guess there's no sand at the pool. You're going to the beach. Okay, and there's lots of sand. If I had a mole of sand, it would cover the surface of the United States three inches thick. Just sand particles. Our numbers are huge. Astronomical. Okay? So instead of counting them out and writing out 23 zeros, we use scientific notation. In physics, you'd weigh the Earth. We do. We weigh the Earth. In physics, we find that the Earth is made of somewhere around, I think it's uh, 8 to the 20 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Okay? We weigh the Earth. That's a huge number. It's incredibly massive. Now, not as massive as the sun, but incredibly massive. When we look at the Earth, we realize okay, that we don't want to count out that many grams. So we write it in scientific notation to represent such a massive number. Scientific notation. It's important for us because it helps represent very large and very small numbers. Okay? Now, we call this one mole. 
Okay, and this one mole is represented by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So let's say we had two moles of atoms. Okay, it would just be this number times two. But in chemistry, because we have these units, mole, which is an SI unit, we can just write two M-O-L-E, and we're done. So units, prefixes, and scientific notation are there to make our life easier, are there so that we, as scientists, can quickly write numbers and calculate numbers that are astronomical, so that we don't have to spend our whole lifetime making one calculation. That's why we use it. All right, now, scientific notation. When we look at our sheet, we're, we can see that there are some example problems. Uh, when we talk about uh, the mole, 6.02 times 10 to 23rd, there it's in number one under scientific notation. Okay, it also allows us to write things in powers of 10, and we talked about that with scientific notation. Okay, part A, 3A, someone read it out loud for me, please. You're going to move a decimal point. How many of you have moved decimal points before? And what is the method we use? Yeah, say it out loud. I call it the loop-de-loop-de-loop-de-loop-de-loop. -loop -de -loop -de -loop. Yeah, that one. That's a very scientific term. You can look it up. It's probably not in any dictionary, but in this classroom, it's very, very important. The loop-de-loop-de-loop-de-loop-de-loop. -loop -de -loop -de -loop -de -loop, okay? That's what we do in to find something in scientific notation. So let's say we have 0 0.003. Okay, this is not in scientific notation. Here's the decimal, but this is not a non-zero number. So what do we do? We move the decimal using the loop-de-loop-de-loop-de-loop-de-loop, -loop -loop -loop. okay? So here we go. We're going to take this red pen. We're going to go over. Let's count it as a class. One. You guys are lame. Two. Three. There it is. Boom. Three places. Three loops, okay? And we put the decimal here. Now, we're going to rewrite this number as 3 times this decimal. Then we can put a 0 here, kind of as a placeholder. And then we put it times 10. Because remember, we're writing this in scientific notation. The question then becomes, what is our exponent? OK? Now, we have to think about this for a second. We moved it three spots. So there is going to be a 3 up here. But the hard part is remembering, is it positive or is it negative? So this is where logic comes in, right? Yeah, logic. 10 to the third power is 1,000, OK? Which represent by kilo. 1,000. If I multiply 3 times 1,000, what do I get? 3,000. Is that this number? No, it's 3,000th. So my exponent actually has to be what? Negative. It has to be negative. So if I move the decimal to the right, if I move the decimal to the right, okay, then my exponent is going to become more what? It's going to become more negative. It's going to become smaller. Okay? Let's do another example. Let's say that I have 65 100 as a number. Where's the decimal? Here it's not actually visible. But there is a decimal. It's always there, even if it's playing hide and go seek. Where's the decimal at? The end. Yeah, right? Here is where the decimal is. Now, all right, so let's move it. We're going to move it. One, two, three. Boom, stop. Why did I stop there? It's just to the right of this last digit. So it's going to be 6.5 okay, times 10. In this case, what do I want? I'm going to want positive 3. Why not negative 3? I'm going which direction? Left. Okay, But the reason I want positive 3 is because when I have a 3 here, it makes this whole term 1,000. If I multiply 6.5 times 1,000, I get 6,500. So really, it's the same. But now I'm writing it as a different type of number. 
Now, some of you might be going, well, Mr. Bornheimer, this seems like a lot more work. I've got to write a six. I got to put a decimal. There wasn't even a decimal I had to write before. Got to put a five. Then I got to put an X. Then I got to put a 10. Then I got to put an exponent. Bam, this is like a ton of work. But I could have just wrote six, five, zero, zero. And yes, I concede, okay? However, there are going to be numbers you're going to work with that are lots of zeros. For instance, numbers like, oh, I don't know, like this. And the zeros just keep on going and going and going and going and going and going and going. Okay, so in those kinds of numbers, yeah, scientific notation is a lot less to write. Okay, and that's when it becomes very useful to us. We have you practice with smaller numbers because they're easier to work with. So when you see questions like convert 12 to scientific notation, that's not really all that necessary. However, we have you do that because it's a lot easier than converting 12 trillion, okay, or something like that. So scientific notation. Let's say that you have something that's very similar to scientific notation, but not quite. Let's say that you have 45 times 10 to the third meters, okay? Is this in scientific notation? No, it's not. It's got a decimal, and it's actually, the decimal is kind of like right here, but there's two numbers to the left. That's not scientific notation, not at all. So we need to put it in scientific notation because as scientists, we use scientific not notation, not some Joe somebody's notation or some kind. So we have to move the decimal. We're going to have to move the decimal. But in doing so, what do we have to change? Let's say we're going to move the decimal one place. OK. But then what do we have to change? Yeah, we have to change the exponent. And this is where people get confused. Now, maybe not you folks, but most students, most everywhere, this is the hardest part of scientific notation. When you have to convert something that's similar into scientific notation, and you forget, does the exponent go up or does the exponent go down? Now, I'm going to show you a way that you might not have seen before. And if you're really good at left, up, or down, or whatever the rules are, then fine. You can use those. However, I'm going to show you the algebraic way of being certain, 100% sure, every time that you have the right answer. Okay, And it deals with substitution. So I'm going to pull 45 down, and I'm going to say, that 45 is really the same thing as 4.5 times 10 to what power? We're not worried about this original power. I'm just looking at 45. So 4.5, what would I multiply it by to get 45? Just this, not this. Just 45, 4.5. If I were to plug it into my calculator and multiply it by something, and I wanted 45 as my answer, what would I multiply by? 10. 10. That's it. Okay, 10. So just 10, 10 to the first. That's the same thing as 45. It's the exact same, sort of. Doesn't look the same, but it is the same. 45 is the same as 4.5 times 10 to the first. 10 times 4.5 is 45. Now you might be thinking, wow, this seems like over the top. And it's not if you want an absolutely 100% accurate answer. Okay, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take this and I'm going to substitute it back in here for 45. And this is what I end up with. Okay, I end up with something like this. 4.5 times 10 to the first. All right, that's my 45 times 10 to the third, because that was my original exponent, meters. Now, how many of you have taken algebra? Okay, you've almost all taken algebra. You know that when you multiply two numbers that have the same base, what do you do with the exponents? You just, say it louder. You add them, yeah, it's easy. You just add them. So, in this particular situation, my 1 plus my 3 becomes a 4. Yeah, 4.5 times 10 to the fourth meters would be my answer. Now, you might be thinking that's a lot of work. And if that it seems too much for you, fine. However, some people really do get confused with the whole moving the decimal, moving the exponent up or down. 
This is a surefire way of getting it right. You take the first number, you convert it to scientific notation, plug it back in, and add the exponents. That will be the same every time. Had this been a negative 3, what would have been my answer? Had this been a negative 3, this would have been a negative 2. Okay? It doesn't matter. You're always going to add the exponents. So instead of it becoming a complicated remembering up or downs problem, it becomes just add the exponents problem. It's super easy. Okay, it's super easy. And it relies on algebra, and it never fails, ever, ever, ever. I've seen more students make mistakes on scientific notation because they're trying to remember if the exponent goes up or down, especially with the negatives, because it's counterintuitive. A more negative exponent is a smaller number. Okay, so this is a good way of remembering scientific notation. Okay, any questions about scientific notation? Okay, for those of you that like rules, for those of you that like rules, we now know that the answer is 4.5 times 10 to the fourth. So here's your rules, if this is the way you learned it. When you go left, the number goes up. If the number is negative, let's say from negative 3, and it goes up, it would become a negative 2. So the number will actually become, look, smaller, 3 to 2. 2 smaller than 3. However, when you throw a negative out front, negative 2 is actually larger than negative 3. So when you move left, the number goes up. When you move right, the number goes down. So if you want the simple rule and you think that's much easier to remember, by all means, write it down. When you move the decimal left, the, number, the exponent goes up in value. When you move the decimal right, the exponent goes down in value. That's a great rule to remember. All right, that's a great rule to remember. Any questions about this? Any questions at all? Okay.